The Canal, part of Chapter 9 of A History of Horncastle from the Earliest Period to the Present Time, by James Conway Walter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Canal The Horncastle Canal, connecting for commerce the town with the river Witham, and so with Lincoln, Boston and the sea, though now a derelict, was formerly of much value. Its history is here given from its earliest inception. Horncastle, having been for some centuries the chief market of an important agricultural district, an association was formed towards the close of the eighteenth century with the title the Company of Proprietors of Horncastle Navigation in the County of Lincoln. This was, in the year 1792, incorporated by an Act of Parliament, which gave a list of the names of the original members, and secured to them, and to their successors, perpetual possession of the same, and a common seal. The canal was to be eleven miles long, extending from the junction of the two rivers, Bain and Waring, which traverse the town and meet at the point where now stands the public swimming bath, to the Witham at Tattershall and passing through the parishes of Thornton, Martin, Dolderby, Rooton, Horton, Kirkby, Cunningsby, and Tattershaw. The company had at first a capital of £15,000 in £50 shares, no member being allowed to hold less than one share or more than twenty. The surveyors for the undertaking were Messrs Robert Stickney and Samuel Dickinson. When about two-thirds of the work was completed, this capital was exhausted, and in the year 1800 a second Act of Parliament was obtained, which authorised the raising of a supplementary sum of £20,000 in shares of £50, additional members being enrolled, and mortgages raised on the tolls. The whole profits of the concern, for several years, were absorbed in paying off the debt thus contracted so that no dividend accrued for the shareholders until the year 1813. The channel, from Horncastle to Dolderby, was an entirely new cut, the rest being the River Bain, deepened and straightened in its course. It was adapted for the passage of vessels of fifty tons burden, and in the whole length of eleven miles there was a fall of eighty-four feet. The original rate of charges was two shillings per ton for the whole length of the canal, one shilling and ninepence to the seventh lock, and one shilling and threepence to the fourth lock. Vessels laden with lime, manure, or material for roads, were granted free passage. By the second Act of Parliament, in 1800, the charges were raised to three shillings and threepence per ton for the whole length of the canal, two shillings and sevenpence to the seventh lock, and one shilling and sixpence to the fourth lock lime, manure, and road material being exempted, as before. The whole structure was completed in the autumn of 1802, and the canal was formally opened on Friday, September the 17th of that year. The occasion was observed as a general holiday by the townsfolk. At one o'clock, the boats, the Betsy of Horncastle, and the Martha of Dolderby, the property of Messrs Gilliatt and Wilson, and the British Queen, owned by Mr Boyers, were hauled into the two basins of the canal, elaborately decorated with colours, amid the cheers of spectators, who are said to have numbered more than two thousand. The vessels having been brought to, several salutes were fired, and a band of music on the pleasure boat of Mr. Lane played God Save the King, Rule Britannia, Hearts of Oak, etc. Having traversed some distance on the canal, the company afterwards landed at the wharfs on the two branches, and a large number of the shareholders partook of a festive repast at the Great Hound Inn, East Street, near the South Basin. The navvies and other workmen who had been employed in the construction of the canal were also regaled on the boats, and afterwards feasted at the Greyhound. In following years, an excursion was made annually by the directors, conveyed down the canal in a fine barge, which was their own property, named the Lady Banks in order to inspect its condition, and this was followed by a public dinner at the Bull Hotel, which continued to be an established institution during the period of the canal's prosperity. The shares quickly rose considerably in value. A great number of barges came to the town, 
and it was no uncommon occurrence to see the whole distance from the south bridge to the bow bridge packed closely with heavily laden vessels carrying coals grain or other merchandise in eighteen thirty six it was computed that about thirty thousand quarters of wheat and three thousand packs of wool passed through the canal annually and in eighteen fifty the profits of the traffic amounted to about two thousand pounds a year consequent on the opening of the railway in august eighteen fifty five the canal as a means of goods conveyance gradually became disused until of late years it has become worse than a mere derelict since it forms an obstruction to the free passage of the water brought down by the two rivers and after heavy rain it has led to temporary inundations of the town to the great inconvenience of those residing near it as well as interfering as might in some circumstances be serious with the sanitary arrangements a few years ago an attempt was made to restore the canal traffic but the railway monopoly had become too thoroughly established and the project failed yet the competition could it have been maintained might have had a salutary effect upon the cost of railway conveyance to the advantage of the general public our canals it should be remembered are a time-honoured institution the lincolnshire cardyke and fosdyke date from the period of the roman occupation of this country the magna charta of the early thirteenth century took cognizance not only of the roads called the king's highway but also of inland navigation under the term o stream de leroy the latter half of the eighteenth century was remarkable for great achievements as regards internal waterways notably in the bridgewater canal and the grand junction canal of london and to this period as we have seen the horncastle canal belongs in this twentieth century again notwithstanding the great railway facilities there is a widespread movement in favour of extended water traffic headed by the very successful suez canal with a prospect of the sister channel of panama berlin is said to owe its prosperity largely to its well-organised system connecting the rivers oder elbe spray etc which have an annual traffic of some million and a half tons our own manchester ship canal is another instance the most recent case being fresh developments of the air and colder navigation in south yorkshire the canals too which have been recently constructed in india are yielding by the latest reports a handsome revenue to the government as well as greatly benefiting the native population it is acknowledged that a more general use of waterways throughout the kingdom for the cheaper transport of our heavier and more bulky produce would be a national boon and a royal commission was engaged in considering the subject of the acquisition of all canals as government property it is now being more and more recognised that on the establishment of railways every one jumped too hastily to the conclusion that the days of canals were over whereas in truth there is still a large field probably an increasing field for the cheaper traffic in heavy goods which canals can provide for the belgian town of bruges though situated several miles inland is now to be converted into a port by the government of that country through the creation of a canal which is expected to increase the prosperity of that city similarly it is suggested that our own town of nottingham could be made a great inland port if water carriage were provided and sir john turney before the royal commission has recently july nineteen o seven stated that the trade of that town might thus be greatly increased these be it remembered are not isolated cases as to our own local interests we may reasonably regret that after so much money being invested in the horncastle canal and the serious losses incurred by so many investors no further effort should be made to utilize it the trade of horncastle is not so satisfactory but that we might welcome every adjunct which could in any way contribute to its furtherance while even from an aesthetic point of view it were desirable that with the present dilapidated locks and the banks in some places broken the channel which is in parts little more than a shallow bed of mud befouled by garbage and carrion or choked by a matted growth of weeds should be superseded by a flow of water pure and emitting no pestiferous exhalations end of the canal part of chapter nine of a history of horncastle from the earliest period to the present time by james conway walter